All right. It looks like everyone has mostly connected to audio. So I'm going to go ahead and um, welcome our guests. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome two presenters today. Chris Mansky of Mansky Wealth Management, who will be speaking to you all about business development, and Jim Hudson with Crane, Caden, and James, who will be speaking about patent trolls. And Chris is a frequent guest on national podcasts and TV shows and can also be seen on Yahoo Finance, Think Advisor, MSN, CEO World, and many others. Chris's first book, The Prepared Investor Challenges Wall Street's Typical Approach to Crisis Investing. And his latest book, Outsmart the Money Magicians, is coming out in November of this year and explains how to maximize one's net worth by seeing through the most powerful illusions performed by Wall Street and the IRS. And Jim, who will be our second presenter today, is with the Houston office of Crane, Caton, and James. He received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M and graduated from South Texas College of Law, uh, Houston. He assists clients in securing inter intellectual property rights, including trademarks, tra trade secrets, copyrights, and patents, including ensuring safeguards for trade secrets and obtaining registrations from the United States trademark offices and the Library of, of Congress. I'm so pleased to welcome both of them to join us today. They will be um, taking questions at the end of the hour. So if you have questions for Chris, you can enter those in the chat and uh, they will take those questions after Jim has presented. And same thing with Jim. If you have questions, please feel free to enter those in the chat and look for those to be addressed at the end. And if we do run out of time for questions, um, both of their information, contact information will be provided to you and feel free to reach out. The MCLE uh, information will be provided to you um, as soon as possible uh, following the uh, presentation. So please look for that. And um, without further ado, I'm pleased to uh, hand the floor over to Chris. Uh, so Chris, thank you so much for being with us here today. And the, the electronic floor, the virtual floor is all yours. I'm glad to be on the virtual stage. Thank you for the introduction, Chelsea. And also I'd like to say thank you to my friend, uh, Pat Huttenbach, who had introduced me to you and to this uh, opportunity. Uh, if I was in the attendee's shoes right now, I'd probably be looking for different information in the introduction. So the reason I say that is because there was a book I read called Principles by Ray Dalio, which could be a good book to add to your own reading list. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the takeaways that I got from that book was the importance of not taking advice from someone unless they have clearly and successfully done the thing they are giving advice about. So as you heard from Chelsea, I'm about to talk to you about growth, practice development, specifically growth as a service professional. So this is applicable to lawyers and bankers, investment advisors. And I think I'd like to share with you some more information about myself so that you've got that confidence that I have done what I'm talking about. I lead a service organization. We offer investment advice. It is an intangible, just like legal advice or banking services. CPAs, lawyers, investment advisors, insurance agents, bankers, we all have similar hurdles to growth. And here's how I have done with those hurdles, just real quickly. I was recognized multiple times while at Merrill Lynch as one of the fastest growing financial advisors in the nation. I wasn't in their top 1%. I was in their fraction of 1%. I was tagged to coach other investment advisors and I spent a year traveling the country helping Merrill Lynch investment advisors grow their practices. I spoke with thousands of them. My own firm is over 10 years old. And in that time, the enterprise has grown from being just me and an assistant to one of the largest advisory shops in Houston. We're responsible for advising on over a billion dollars of client net worth, and we directly supervise about $500 million. I don't share these things to brag. Instead, I really wish to catch your attention so that you know the methodologies I'm about to share work. The title of my presentation today is Be a Rainmaker because I will be talking to you about growth. My agenda is simply three stories. The first story is called The Location Decision in which I'll describe the biggest reason service-oriented professionals like us fail to grow. And the second story is about balance and how it can help or hurt your growth goals. 
And finally, I'll close with The Baker's Dozen, which is a story about how to grow. Thanks for putting your questions in the chat, uh, like Chelsea had mentioned. And uh, as soon as you know, I'm done being your webinar storyteller, I'll hand it over to Jim Hudson, who has an excellent PowerPoint and a wonderful talk to close our session. So to begin, the location decision, a quick story. Uh, I used to work with a gentleman who owned 15 different Subway sandwich shops. And one of the things that he complained about was the lack of authority or autonomy. He and I discussed about how an owner of a sandwich shop doesn't get to pick what products to sell. Every Subway sells the same sandwiches and he does not get to select how to make the sandwiches. He doesn't get to pick the wallpaper. He doesn't get to pick the furniture. You know, they all have the same yellow booths. He doesn't even get to pick the wage that he'll pay his employees. Subway creates a range based on the local economy. And the same goes for the prices that they charge for their sandwiches. The owner has no control over any of that. And when you hear all this, it's reasonable to ask, how can you even call him a business owner, right? Well, there is one thing that they do get to pick and they control it 100%. In fact, the company puts a lot of time and money into helping the owner with this special item because it's critical that they get it right. And the thing I'm talking about is the location decision. Where do you locate your shop? If you set up a Subway sandwich shop at, out in the desert, you know, in the corner of Nowhere Street and Nobody Avenue, you aren't going to sell any subs. But if you set it up in a high traffic area, well, then you can expect to do pretty well. Subway and the local owner do a lot of homework and they seriously contemplate that location decision. It's months, sometimes more than a year in the making. And once it's made, they don't have to think about it anymore at all. It's done. Now, all they have to do is make sure that their sign is lit up because people see the sign and they pop in to make the owner a rich person. If you're wondering right now, how does this relate to bankers and lawyers and investment advisors? Well, let's take the typical attorney in her first five years at a mid-sized firm. We'll call her Mary. Mary does not get to pick what products to sell. It just depends on what area of law that she focuses on. She probably doesn't pick the wallpaper in the office, nor does she select the furniture and decor. The firm decides the pricing structure and how Mary can collect payment from her clients. This is all starting to sound kind of similar, right? I am here to tell you that Mary has the same authority that a sandwich shop owner has. She gets to determine her location. And that's probably confusing because the office building that the firm or the bank is located in, that doesn't uh, really pay a, a big role in what the young attorneys or bankers get to choose. So stay with me and I'll explain the connection. A sandwich shop, it's a physical thing in the real world. The location decision determines who will see it, who will drive by it. How easy is it for a customer to stop in and make a purchase? Subway puts so much attention into the location decision, and after it's made, they can ignore it because it's a physical, real-world location. Once it's occupied, the owner puts a sign out in front, and people can see that sign, and they know the store is there, and customers can come inside and give the store their business. Can you imagine a Subway sandwich shop owner putting a tarp over their signs? putting plywood over the window so no one can see inside. Never, this would obviously be terrible business, yet that is exactly what many attorneys, bankers, investment advisors like myself, it's what they do with their business. Because you see the physical location for most attorneys is less important. They can go to the clients, they can meet them at a coffee shop or at a subway shop. Uh, they can invite clients into their office. Mary, the young attorney, doesn't get to pick the physical location of her office because the fact is, whichever office building the firm is located in, that probably doesn't contribute a whole lot to whether or not people hire her. Mary's location decision is virtual. 
She doesn't have a retail storefront like a Subway sandwich shop. Instead, she has her time and activity. The attorney's location decision is not a physical real world thing. For people to know that she exists, Mary has to do something out in the community to ensure that people know about the option to give their business to her. And this is the biggest reason that service-oriented professionals like bankers, investment advisors, lawyers, CPAs, this is why they fail to grow. They can't be a rainmaker because they don't take their location decision seriously. Your location decision, just like mine, it's a daily discipline. And that's different from Subway's location decision, which was made and done. They would never board up their shop and hide it from customers. Yet investment advisors and attorneys do it every day with their own location decision. They choose to work at their desk on activities that do not grow their practice. It's the same as covering up the sign because while you're doing that non-growth focused activity, no one knows that you exist. If you're organizing your files, if you're attending administrative meetings, if you're opening a bottle of wine in front of Netflix at home, it, all of these are locations that are not growth oriented. And it's the same thing as putting a tarp over your store signage. No one knows that professionals like us exist unless we do something to get the word out. We have to interact with the world on a regular basis to make it easy for people to stop in and buy our sandwiches. We just don't have the luxury of setting aside our location decision. We have to properly locate ourselves every single day, every single hour, over and over. Renew that commitment to letting the world know that we are open for business. Every minute, you could ask yourself if your shop is at the corner of nowhere and nobody, like I said before. If it is, don't worry you are not alone because that's where the majority of other service professionals are located as well. Welcome to average. But if you're seeing a glimmer of the opportunity that I'm talking about and you want to make a better location decision tomorrow, then you're going to love my third story today called The Baker's Dozen. But first, the second story is about balance and how people often don't realize what they are aiming for. So to begin my second story, I'd like to define the word balance. Most people agree that balance exists when you've got a certain list of priorities and you've given those priorities the proper amount of attention, you know, based on you and your needs. There's lots of ways to make that list of priorities. One of my favorites is called the seven Fs. So that's faith, family, finances, fitness, friends, fun, and the last F is future. But whatever your list of life categories happens to be, I want to ask you a question. Can we say that you are balanced if you do a little bit of all of your priorities every single minute? So that means there's seven seconds for sleep, two seconds with your parents, two seconds with your friends, three seconds working, and a minute later you start all over again. Come on, this is a stupid question. Of course, that is a broken system. Okay, so then what if I change the timeline and see if we could balance our life every hour? Now we have 10 minutes for sleeping, 10 minutes working out, 10 minutes at Temple. You know, it still doesn't work. But I think you can see the point I'm making. The timeline matters. The reason the timeline you use for balance is important is because once we get to a 24 hour period, once we start talking about a day, then suddenly a lot of people say, yes, that's a timeline that works for me. Maybe even some people listening to this talk feel that way right now. If we extend the timeline to a week long cycle, the vast majority of Americans buy in and they say that that is the timeline that they use to achieve balance. There are definitely people listening to this presentation right now who feel this way. And I am not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying that approaching balance on a short timeline will make it hard to be a rainmaker. And I'm asking you, how did you come to seek balance on a weekly basis? 
most people do not actively consciously choose it because it's a Western perspective that people just kind of slip into as they assume the role of business person. It's this uh, you know daily or weekly timeline for balance. And it does have some flaws. The main flaw is that you give up on the joy of focusing on something fulfilling, on becoming excellent at that one thing. In place of that focus, you have the juggle, keeping a lot of balls in the air on a short timeline. Many deep thinkers on the subject of happiness suggest that you're sacrificing depth and meaning when you think of balance on a weekly or even a monthly basis. They suggest balance over a decade or even over multiple lifetimes because happiness is the byproduct of aiming at difficulty. I'll say that again. Happiness is the byproduct of aiming at difficulty. Whether you study Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Dalai Lama, the obstacle is the way. The more difficult the climb up the mountain, the sweeter the joy upon reaching the top. Ladies and gentlemen, Olympic athletes are not living balanced lives. Fortune 500 CEOs, military generals, most successful business owners fall in the same category. Let me describe a client that I used to work with. He has since deceased. He was an immigrant to the United States and he thought of balancing his priorities over three lifetimes, his, his children's and his grandchildren. His routine would be to wake up very early, six, sometimes seven days a week, and he would work productively until dinner time. And then typically he'd work a little more before going to sleep. He told me one time that lunch breaks are a waste of time. We had a long intimate talk once and I gently accused him of being a workaholic, probably something you all are thinking right now about him, but I was wrong. He knew that he was achieving balance for his loved ones over multiple lifetimes because his kids, they do have more prosperity and security than he did. His family respected him. His community valued him. He had purpose in his life. And this idea of you need to be balanced to be happy, he laughed at it saying that balance with that definition is the path of mediocrity. The easier it gets, the less happy we are. The more that you focus on balancing all the balls on a weekly basis, the less you can really dig into one or two areas of your life and meaningfully challenge yourself. I suggest that if you focus your attention on bringing in new business and being a rainmaker, you don't just increase your financial success, you also find meaningful purpose from doing good for your fellow person and the happiness that comes with that. I mean, that's the joy of being a service professional. All of us, we're helping our communities. The work that we do is useful to the people around us. And that's proven to be a strong influencer for lower stress and living longer. The next five years is the time for a focus like what I'm describing. And for those of you who agree with me that the time has come and you want to grow your practice with new clients, well, you probably would like to know how to bring in new business. And that is my third story, which I call the Baker's Dozen. Once upon a time, <laughs> it begins just like a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a baker who made cupcakes. She is the hero of our story because she made really, really good cupcakes. But the problem is that no one knew that she existed because she worked out of her home. So in order to sell those cupcakes, she had to make her location decision over and over every day and make sure that people were aware that she had a great product to sell. And the way she did that is she'd go down to the corner with a sign whenever she had a spare moment. And the sign said, I've got the best cupcakes for sale. One day, our hero looked at the sales that she had made over the last few months, and she asked herself, where did this business come from? Is my sign down at the corner working? It turns out that she got a lot of business from a wedding planner. This wedding planner would 
use her cupcakes whenever a wedding or rehearsal dinner uh, required them. Our baker also got a lot of business from a food truck owner. The food truck would buy a certain amount of cupcakes every week to go with their tacos. The baker found this information interesting and she went back out to the corner with her sign, just like always. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the story because that is what most people do. Most professionals have a couple friends or a couple contacts that occasionally give them business. And for that reason, they're in the average or slightly above average category. They might wish that it was better, but then they just keep going about things like they always have. So let's say that one person listening to this webinar, and, and you know what? I, I say one person because the stats show that the majority of people listening to this will spend the next month doing the exact same thing that you've done in the past. But let's say that one of you decides to embrace difficulty and do something more. Here is something you could try because it gets results. The baker's dozen is a rainmaker's tactic, and this is how it works. So first, you sit down and you make a list with 13 entries, 13, a baker's dozen. The list is not of people you know. It's a list of 13 jobs that easily give you referrals. So for example, I think everyone on this call should have a financial advisor as a partner. If you don't have one, please let me know offline because I have some top-notch folks on my team that would love to shake your hand. But in addition to an investment expert, you might consider a banker, an insurance agent, maybe a realtor. Let's say that in your legal practice, you focus on the needs of business owners. Then you probably should know a good investment banker who helps business owners sell their practice. A good commercial real estate broker helps them to find space. An HR manager, a, a mid-market consultant, and the list goes on. You can think of other service providers that are useful to your target market. But let's say you can't think of any. This happened once. I was talking to a family law attorney that uh, did a lot of uh, divorce work. And he said that he didn't know when someone was going to get a divorce. And so he couldn't really network or do anything to be a rainmaker. I told him that he was not really trying and that he should deeply reflect on why he's not trying. I am not a divorce attorney. I'm not in that field, but I can come up with a bunch of professionals that could give him referrals. A financial advisor is one. We often know about the divorce before it happens, but that's not the only one. Professional therapists. Therapists often know and they get asked for referrals to a good divorce attorney. But how about if we be creative? What other careers could refer to a divorce attorney? Studies show that as part of an affair, women radically change their hairstyle and affairs lead to divorce. I know an attorney in Seattle who befriended two different high-end hairstylists and told them that he would pay for them to have a wine tasting or a get together once a month. So we're talking about, you know, a little wine, a little food at a cool place. He told them, look, invite anyone that month who does a major change to their hair and make sure that they tell them to bring a friend with them, you know, and that way you get to meet their friends and get more haircut business. So he would attend the wine tasting or whatever the gathering was. And as the months went by, everyone, the stylist and the attorney did extremely well because of that ongoing cheap activity, you know, out in the community. Here's another one. Uh, during a separation, but prior to the divorce, people often hire a personal trainer. You know, the, they're worried about, you know, I have to get out there again, right? And this is part of getting ready. Anyway, the list goes on. If you can't make a list, it's because you aren't trying. So once you've written down 13 jobs that easily feed you referrals, then you need to fill in two or three names of real people who do that work. And it can't just be random people or people from your current network. The name should be people that you know and trust, people who respect you and respect what you do for a living, people that you could meet with once a year or so and ask them for a referral. If you don't have at least 30 people who know you, like you, and are willing to give you referrals, 
then you need to get out there and meet new people to fill in those blanks on your baker's dozen list. And while you're out there trying to meet new people, guess what? You're going to meet people that aren't even related to the list, but they still will be helpful to you in some way. And that's called networking. If you stick with it, then at the end of this exercise, you'll have a relationship with around 30 people in 13 different fields that easily refer to you. That's 13 slots times two to three names each. That means that your influence in the community will have meaningfully changed. Uh, it means that you've got a great accomplishment under your belt. And the view is beautiful from on top of you know, that baker's dozen mountain. But climbing down the mountain is part of the challenge as well. Now that you have your list, each year you need to use that list to organize coffees, lunches, you know, other meaningful interactions so that you can exchange referrals and keep those relationships alive. The baker's dozen is incredibly powerful. And for those of you who actually commit to doing it, you will not be sorry. So with that, thank you for listening as I shared the location decision, which detailed the importance of letting people know every day that you have a valuable service to offer. I also described how the modern Western concepts of balance and happiness sometimes pin us down in the average quagmire of juggling everything in a short timeline. And lastly, I gave specific guidance on how to increase your influence at your firm and in this community so that you can get more referrals and meaningfully grow your practice. My name again is Chris Mansky, and I've really enjoyed being a storyteller for you on this webinar. Uh, please do put your questions in the chat as I'm now turning over the microphone to Jim Hudson of Crane, Caton, and James. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that greatly. I thought that was a great presentation. I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to try and share my screen. Hopefully, we will see a uh, PowerPoint presentation coming up. If you don't see it, please let me know. So as mentioned, I'm Jim Hudson. I'm a Crane, Kate, and James here in Houston, Texas. I'm a patent attorney. So I get to do various attributes of intellectual property enforcement, prosecution and administrative challenges. So I work to get to secure patents and trademarks. I get to do litigation, both enforcement and defense. Uh, that means I'm often in uh, the Southern District of Texas, Eastern District of Texas, Marshall, uh, Waco uh, has a good docket, but it also means I may be in other courts such as New Hampshire. I also get to do transactions including transfers and uh, MSAs. And one of the things I like about doing all three of these is that they there's a synergy, they feed each other. A couple items, disclaimers. What I'm providing, of course, is not legal advice. It doesn't create an attorney-client relationship. I'm not providing any warranties. So, a couple points. Is there an increase of patent infringement litigation? What's a patent? When, how, and by whom is a patent infringed? What is a non-practicing entity or a patent assertion entity or a patent troll? Are they all patent assertion entities? Uh, why do these people sue? What does a patent infringement suit look like? And how can some of the risk and exposure be reduced? I, obviously, the big key here is the last bullet point, but we're gonna have to get through the others so that we can understand why that risk uh, is and how it can be reduced. So is there an increase in patent infringement litigation in the financial services sector? Yes. There was a program for business method patent reviews at the Patent and Trademark Office. We call that the USPTO. Uh, that administrative challenge program has ended. Uh, Bloomberg News identified a three-fold increase in lawsuits against financial institutions. Waco, Texas is the new marshal for patent infringement actions. If you didn't know, Marshall, Texas uh, and the Eastern District adopted some patent rules, rules specific for patent cases. That got us a much faster docket. As a result, it became very attractive to sue there. There were a lot of issues with people having to go to Marshall. As a result, there were some changes in the venue statute. Waco became the, the new go-to uh, because, of course, when you file in Waco, you're going to get Judge Albright. Waco has tried to address that situation, but for right now, 
you can assume that if you file in or a case is filed in Waco, that there's a good likelihood Judge Albright is going to be the patent case, uh, the judge for that patent case. And as a result, the judge has patent case management programs that delay discovery until after the contours of whatever the patent claim or argue to the court, i.e., what does a word mean? What does withstand mean? Uh, and that can be very frustrating because that means you are in the lawsuit until such time as the court even begins to look at the case to determine what words mean. Uh, of course, as a defense attorney, you want to make sure that those words mean something you're not doing. Uh, the plaintiff obviously is looking for the broadest interpretation, but as a result, it's a long slog to get there. So what is a patent? And I apologize if some of y'all have already seen this. It's an area that some people haven't. So a patent is a government issued right, it's in the US Constitution, to exclude, it's the big issue, exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling or importing into the United States the invention claimed in the patent. The patent can claim multiple inventions. Again, it's noteworthy. Just because you have a patent doesn't mean you can actually practice the invention. It only means that you can exclude others. There's other type of patents like design patents. That's going to be the door, the ironwork doors. We're not worried about those. Uh, when a patent is awarded, you've got to overcome certain issues to get there. You have to establish that it has novelty. It's new, uh, less than a year in the public. It's an inventive step. It's not obvious, some eureka moment. Uh, and that there's statutory subject matter, which is a long list but it's going to include methods, apparatus, processes, uh, compositions of matter. And that may be new uses for an existing composition of matter. Trying to get a patent is going to typically take a year and a half to three years, though I have some U.S. applications that have been pending for four. I've had some that they turn around and give me a first action in 60 days. So patent has two main sections. This is of some importance. We talk about what the claims are. The first section is the disclosure. It has a lot of pros, has the drawings. Uh, the second section is the claims, which is a single sentence. Each claim is a single sentence that defines what the meets and bounds of the invention are. The best way to describe this is in a real estate transaction. Uh, you know, the buyer sees from the realtor a beautiful glossy sheet that identifies Here's what the house is. It has these rooms. Each room is this size. The roof was just replaced in this year. Uh, it has these other attributes. The, it has this type of a yard. It has a pool. It has all these wonderful details of pictures. That's like our disclosure. But at the end of the day, the transaction is, here's a deed that identifies the meets and bounds of what the property is. That's what our patent claims are. Now, the claims are informed by what's in the disclosure but the, the claim is going to control what actually is covered. So an example, if you lived in a world where stools and chairs didn't exist and we all still sat on the ground or rocks, uh, and I came up with an invention, I hadn't had it out for more than a year, uh, I had a device for sitting, which comprised a platform, having a platform top and a bottom, the platform having a width and a depth, and having three legs, each of said legs having a first leg end and a, and a leg second end, where each of those three legs is attached to the platform bottom at the first at the leg first end, and each of the three legs downwardly depends from the platform. I've invented the stool. Uh, it's a lot of words, but I've invented the stool, and now I can exclude others in this hypothetical world from making, using, or selling the stool. Uh, I may have a dependent claim within that same patent, so I may have multiple claims. And it's going to improve upon what I've got because I'm getting more narrow as I go. And I'm going to have, I'm going to add a back, which is going to have a top and a bottom. It's going to have a width equivalent to the platform. And the back is going to be affixed to the platform top. And I'm going to add a fourth leg. So I'm adding to with this prior claim. And the fourth leg is attached and it definitely depends. I've invented the chair. Um, and again, I can exclude others from making, using, or selling the chair. What happens if a second person comes and makes an improvement over my invention, which she calls the rocking chair? She files an application some 10 years after mine is on file. I'm paying the maintenance fee, so I'm keeping my patent alive. Uh, 
it's patentable over the stool and even on the chair because it has something no one thought of. It has rockers. So we have the four legs, and now we've added C, a first rocker and a second rocker, and we've rocker, and we've attached those. So she can block others, including me, from making the rocking chair. She has a patent on the rocking chair. I can't do that. But she can't make the rocking chair because it includes the parts of my stool. So I can I can sue her from making her product, and I can obtain a reasonable royalty from whatever I need, her sales, uh, as we go. So what is a patent further? It's got a lifespan, maximum lifespan of 20 years. That assumes that you're going to pay the government at years 4, 8, and 12 a maintenance fee. If you don't pay the maintenance fee, the patent expires, it's dedicated to the public, and everybody can practice it. In this example, my stool patent will expire in January of 2020, uh, even if I pay all the maintenance fees. I, can't, I cannot extend a patent which is already out there. Uh, even if I try to make an improvement on it within the same family, it will expire on that same date. If I have a brand new patent and I show how my new dimension is patentable even over the stool and the chair, I could get a new patent. But it, the, the improvement is going to be where the patentability lies. So on January 2020, the rocking chair owner, even I paid all fees, I can't stop the rocking chair owner. She can make all those. And to, to date, all she's been able to do is sue for infringement. So having a patent is very valuable because you can sue others for infringement, even if you're not making the product. What does infringement look like? It's statutory. There's a lot of elements in the statute. We're going to pick only a couple of them. Uh, whoever makes, uses, offers for sale, sells any patent invention in the U.S., whoever actively induces infringement by somebody else, uh, if you supply a substantial, all of a substantial portion of the components of the patent invention, uh, where they're not going to be combined elsewhere, and if you import uh, under certain circumstances. Make, use, and sell are the big issues here. Again, it's strict liability, which means it doesn't matter how it came to you. If you use it, if you sell it, if you offer to sell it, then you're going to have liability. So the one area where offering for sale doesn't create liability is for, any, is for methods. But essentially, for purposes of this discussion, it's going to be any import making, using, selling by a direct infringer, a person or entity, or by an in, uh, in inducement, or, and this is a critical issue, joint or divided infringement. So you have two parties where supposedly one party controls or directs the actions of a third party that perform all the steps of a patent protected method, or where one party uses all the elements. Uh, and there's a benefit from it. Part of the issue here is a patent has a the statute of limitations on patent infringement is six years. So in this case, the patent owner, which might be the inventor, maybe the inventor's company, or it may be some entity which has acquired the patents, whether it's for defensive purposes or more particularly assertion against others, can bring suit even up to six years after expiration of that patent. This is a big issue. So you've now got a 26 year window, if you pay all the maintenance fees, where liability may rise. It is possible to look and see if a patent has expired, it's a public document. So of course, one of the things we always look at is, is the patent still in force? Where do we see some of these situations? Uh, a financial institution may be sued for infringement because a service provider it uses, alone or in combination with, it, with the financial institution, performs all the steps of a patented method. And of course, there's we're up to 10 million on the patent numbers. So the issue is, do does a bank or a credit union in connection with a service provider, for whatever service it is, perform all the steps of a patented method? If so, there's liability. Uh, the issue is going to be, is that liability going to uh, also, well, if it's performed between the two entities, is there enough there to establish uh, 
divided or joint infringement. And alternatively, if it's public, if it's just by one of them, then of course there's going to be a liability issue. We've seen uh, financial institutions sued because they purchased equipment, such as say a computer chip, and the the computer chip is alleged to infringe a patent. Financial institution didn't make the computer chip, didn't design the computer chip. All they did was buy a computer that has the computer chip in it. But they use the they use the computer. So we've seen patent assertion entities assert, well, you practiced all the steps, therefore you have liability. And we've also seen the situation where software, or even a combination of software, is asserted from all the steps of the patented method. So sometimes you just can't tell this is out there with a search because you don't know what you're going to be doing, what the service provider is doing, and what those patents are that are out there. So I mentioned a, a non-practicing entity, patent assertion entity. Uh, the title included trolls. Uh, obviously, the, the non-practicing entities and the patent assertion entities don't like being called trolls. Uh, so we'll use uh, NPA or PAE for our terms going through here. But as you noticed, patent ownership doesn't require practicing any of the patent interventions. You know, you can be a non-practicing entity just because you got the patent in the course of your business and you're not using it, but you're going to go enforce it. But you may have a patent assertion entity, which is trying to monetize a revenue stream off of a patent, which they've acquired from somebody else. And that entity may exist solely for the purpose of suing. Are they all patent assertion entities? No. Uh, some patent infringement suits are brought by patent owners that really believe that another, which may be a competitor, is practicing an invention that they've got a patent on. Now, that argument can also be flipped because as soon as the patent suit is filed, the alleged infringer is going to go administratively challenge the patent as much as possible. But a business may secure a patent for a couple of reasons. Uh, it spent a lot of money developing some solution, get a patent on it. Uh, we're going to build up our own arsenal. So if somebody comes knocking on our door, we're going to turn around and say, well, we like what you're doing. Seems to practice our invention. How about we all sue each other for mutually assured destruction, and we can get this resolved across the license. It may be a marketing tool. Look, uh, we're the best. We have a patent. Or it may be a revenue stream from sales or licensing. So particularly for patent assertion entities, what's in it for them? A floor. The damage model is not what can be established as some sort of lost revenues only. You can have, the statute actually provides, upon funding for the claimant, the court shall award the claimant damages adequate to compensate for the infringement, but in no less than a reasonable royalty for the use of the invention by the infringer together with interest and costs. There's always a floor. Now, what does that floor look like is a complete industry. There's 14 factors in Georgia Pacific that are looked at to determine what is the value of a reasonable royalty. There's experts who will spend days on this. So you get into a patent lawsuit, what does it look like? Why should we care? A couple things, it's a federal lawsuit. As I mentioned, it'll probably spawn some administrative challenges at the Patent and Trademark Office saying this patent should never have issued in the first place. A patent infringement suit is going to be at least 12 months and likely 18 months or more. It's going to be an expensive, distracting proposition. Expensive in that in most patent cases where the damage model is less than a million dollars, the average of attorney's fees is a million. So, of course, that means the patent assertion entities are going to be suing for much more than a million, because in that case, while their fees may go up, the damage model will be higher. What does a patent case look like? This is the Southern District of Texas. And you can see these are a bunch of elements you're not going to see in a conventional civil case. Preliminary infringement contentions. What, do you, what does the patent owner allege is in the area for infringement? Preliminary invalidity contentions. What does the accused infringer assert? is why the patent is invalid. We have to exchange claim terms to say, what does the word withstand mean? Uh, and those discussions can go off the rails. Uh, New Hampshire had a judge actually want to talk about Captain America's shield in connection with withstand. So you never know what's gonna go. Then you'll have, a, you'll have some opportunity for discovery. 
And the court will ultimately have a briefing and a hearing, we call it a Martin hearing, to determine what these terms mean. What does withstand mean in connection with this claim? And it just keeps going. Uh, and you can see that I, ideally it's only 18 and a half months of work, which means we're gonna spend a substantial amount of time. This generates a substantial amount of aggravation for uh, the, the business. It's a distraction because now we have to have our IT personnel. We have to have all of our, we have to talk to salespeople. We go through all sorts of potential witnesses to figure out what is the extent of liability. The cost is not insubstantial. It is not infrequent that I either put the client on speakerphone and turn down the volume or may simply hold the phone one or two feet from my ear because it's completely frustrating to be in these cases where it's very challenging to get out. So what can we do to reduce that risk and exposure? First thing is anything that's developed in-house because that's gonna be entirely an, a liability of the business. So that creates liability. That's where most, if a business realizes that we have something that is unique, we've solved a problem that everybody in the industry has, and we've solved it in a way no one else has. Then in that case, the business may go get an opinion from counsel, freedom to operate. They may even get their own patent search. Uh, get a patent application filed so they can have something in their quiver to pull out in case somebody challenges them. And that's pretty clear cut. We're going to make sure our employees all assign all of all their interest to the business. We're going to make sure that we have labor and employment agreements, that we have regular meetings, trade secrets, et cetera. But the real issue becomes what about the contracts? You know, we may have a situation where we're working on contracts to make sure we can figure out how, how are these, these particular functions going to be performed by a third party. That creates a lot of, of liability. We're going to have some sort of a contract, an MSA or some other contract that's going to control that. So in that type of situation, working with a third party, we want to make sure that we have a good indemnification recognizing that indemnification is going to have some trade-offs. We may have to give up a disclaimer of a warranty of non-infringement. Uh, we may limit the extent of liability by the service provider, how much they can pay us otherwise. Uh, we may limit our recourse and arguments as to how we can go through uh, that indemnification in that case. Those are fairly typical. You're used to seeing those indemnification provisions and other contractual provisions, which will provide those enforcement benefits. Biggest issue for us is we wanna make sure we, you know, the company is obligated to defend or settle, that the coverage includes us and our personnel, that the, that the coverage is to the company's services alone or in combination with other technology. We mentioned the joint or divided infringement. So we see the situation where, well, the financial institution does step one, and it's the, the vendor provides steps two through eight. Well, is there a combined liability there? Because, of course, the issue is the service providers who say, well, we don't do one through eight. We only do two through eight. So a, an indemnification provision probably should cover a loan or in combination with other technologies. Obviously, there could be some sort of notice requirement. It's going to deprive the... We, we want to make sure that the company cannot settle without making sure that there's a full and full release of the customer. Uh, we want to make sure that if the, you know there may be remedies that the, com that the company may want to have in case of threatened litigation, which may be we'll get you a license, we will revise the technology, or or the, the company may require that the termination the agreement be terminated. So those are big issues we want to make sure we look at because when we go through those, we can see that that liability can be quite expensive, time consuming. And of course, these patent assertion entities are getting into the situation because they want to make sure that they're going to get in, get some funds and get out. Um, because if it's a million dollars in fees on either side, 
those patent assertion entities want to find a way to get out. They're going to get in, rec- put, put us at risk, and then try to find a way to settle. Having an indemnification provision, at least if it's a, a vendor provided service, is a great boon because it shifts that expense it, to the, the company. It shifts the obligation to the company to provide counsel. Yes, the customer is still going to be involved in discovery. Yes, the customer is going to want to monitor the case uh, and uh, to have its counsel present, but that's going to be on the company's, the customer's own dime. But those are the major points we want to make sure of when we look at our agreements, that we have good labor and employment coverage on our employment, that we have uh, some sort of freedom to practice, patent search, and that if it's a vendor, we have indemnification. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to shift over to, I guess, I'll let Chelsea run the chat. And if there's any questions, then Chris or I can answer. Well, first of all, thank you to you both so much for your time uh, leading up to today and also for just being here today. Um, uh, Just reading through the chat a bit and... um, some great comments for you. And it looks like, uh, Chris, you had one question in here. I don't know that you got that uh, quite answered. So how much does it typically cost to keep a patent alive? Or uh, how much does it cost to maintain a patent? That's a great question. And as a result, it actually depends. Uh, The reason being that maintenance fees, which are due at that four, eight and year, four, eight and 12 year model are gonna depend on the size of the company. Now, if, a, if it's a small business, then it's going to be about a thousand, two thousand, four thousand. If it's a if it's classified as the SB, by the SBA is not a small business, it's going to be two thousand dollars at the at year four. It's going to be four thousand dollars right now at year eight, and it's going to be eight thousand dollars at year twelve. And what's really interesting is we talked about the claims. So you might have a patent when you file it, you pay by the claim, where the claim, you may have 20 claims, 10 claims, although we've seen some patents that may have 50 claims. Those maintenance fees are independent of the number of claims. It's a flat fee you pay every year. So you pay it for eight and 12. Right. Thank you for the question and thank you for covering that. Now, as everyone else thinks of whether they have questions or not that weren't covered, and usually that's a great sign. If you don't have tons of questions, that means you just covered everything incredibly well. Um, I will uh, mention a few things to everyone on the call. Uh, Just a reminder that the MCLE information will be sent out um, after the event as soon as we can provide that to you. And um, just a reminder to everyone on the call too, that the annual convention for um, the legal, the legal, for SWBC, the legal conference will take place in September, September 27th through the 20, <laughs> through the 29th um, in Denver, Colorado. So please mark your calendars for that. And um, Jim, you'll see that Pat uh, has asked you a question on the chat here. <laughs> uh, an amusing question, if you will. He wants to know what type of flower you would be. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's go with, uh, well, it's kind of hard. I guess I would go with uh, Yellow Rose. Uh, the reason, of course, being that uh, I'm from Texas, as is most of my family, uh, and yellow, obviously, and uh, it's also the color for cavalry units, and also, um, <laughs> yeah, and also the issue being uh, it's got some thorns. Well, for those of you who know Pat, I'm just shocked he didn't ask you what kind of ice cream is your favorite. And for those of you who know Pat as well, um, another shout out to you, Pat, for all of your um, work with the program committee and for putting these together uh, throughout the year. I appreciate all of you for, for your work. And thanks again to Chris and to Jim for your presentations today. They were both fantastic. Um, I know the attendees appreciated them and I really enjoyed sitting through them. So with that, we will close out for the day. Thank you all. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. And just a reminder, if you do come up with questions after the fact, 
please feel free to reach out to Jim or to Chris. Um, <clears throat> and if you are having trouble finding their inf contact information, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to make the connection for you, for you to uh, ask any follow-up questions. So with that, uh, thanks. Have a great afternoon, and we will see you for the next uh, for the next webinar. Uh, bye, everyone. <laughs>